Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. The small Ornithischian dinosaurs tend not to get the same level of focus as their larger and more physically imposing cousins, including the Ceratopsians and the so-called duck-billed hadrosaurs, which rose to prominence during the late Cretaceous. However, all animal groups, no matter how big or successful, emerge from small nondescript ancestors. Just look at the evolution of cetaceans from tiny hoofed ungulates no bigger than cats, and sauropods from tiny bipedal carnivores. In the case of the incredibly widespread hadrosaurs, which were found on most continents except Antarctica and Australia, as far as we know, these were simply highly derived members of the broader clade Ornithopoda, which represented the sister group to the Marginocephalians. Ornithopods first appeared during the Middle Jurassic, roughly 164 million years ago, as small, fleet-footed herbivores that were the dinosaurian equivalents of modern gazelles or muntjac deer. In fact, most non-thyreophoran Jurassic Ornithischians fell into this kind of body plan, with it being the ancestral condition for the entire group. Ornithopods can be defined by a number of anatomical traits, including a lack of body armour, having an elongated pubis that eventually extended past the ilium, and having a missing hole in the lower jaw. They also possessed strong chewing ability, which would be a major factor in their later diversification during the Cretaceous. Aside from the basal hip Psilophodon and its potential close relative Vector Dromaeus, all more derived ornithopods were part of the clade Iguanodontia, which included the Rhabdodontomorphs, the successful Gondwan and Elasmarians, and the subject of today's episode, the Dryomorphs which contained the earliest known relatives of the hadrosaurs. The most basal of these were the dryosaurids, a family of modestly sized, fast-running herbivores from the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous. Many different genera have been assigned to this group in the past, with it still being uncertain exactly how expansive the family should be. As of 2021, about six species have been solidly identified as dryosaurids, centering on the type genus Dryosaurus itself. Native to the late Jurassic Morrison formation, between 155 and 145 million years ago, this leggy animal measured about 3 metres or 10 feet long, and weighed at least 200 pounds. Although no known adult individuals have been identified so far, meaning that we are still uncertain of this creature's overall size. A fast-running herbivore equipped with a snipping beak and strongly ridged teeth for chewing vegetation, the Dryosaurus holotype was about the size of a modern fallow deer buck, and would have been a potential prey species for Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus and Marshosaurus. It would have relied on speed as a means to escape from predators. A closely related genus, Disaltosaurus, was present in the contemporary Tendaguru formation of Tanzania, which generally shared similar animal groups with both the Morrison and late Jurassic Portugal. Unlike Dryosaurus, thousands of fragmentary skeletal elements have been attributed to this genus, giving paleontologists a decent understanding of its life history and development. Disaltosaurus was smaller than its North American cousin, measuring about 2.5 metres or 8.2 feet long, and weighing roughly 180 pounds. Again, no fully mature individuals are known, with the genus being precocial from the time of hatching, reaching sexual maturity at 10 years of age, and having growth rates similar to modern large kangaroos, indicating an endothermic metabolism. It is estimated to have had a life expectancy of roughly 20 years, and would have lived in mixed age herds, with the young following their parents around soon after birth, like modern ostrich chicks do. Other dryosaurids persisted into the early Cretaceous and reached larger body sizes, almost in anticipation of their more massive relatives in Iguanodontia. The genus Valdosaurus, which was native to what is now the Isle of Wight in the UK, was the largest dryosaurid, measuring up to 5 metres or 16 feet long. Paleoartist Mark Whitten described the genus, as well as dryosaurids as a whole, as superb athletes, with particularly long, robust legs for their overall size. Also noting that Valdosaurus appears from a very common and long-lived genus, persisting for about 20 million years, although most of the remains attributed to it are pretty fragmentary. Valdosaurus lived alongside famous dinosaurs such as its far larger cousin Iguanodon, the Ankylosaur Polacanthus, and the theropods Neovenator and Baryonyx. It would have been the fastest of the Wealdon dinosaurs, easily able to outrun any predator in its environment. Beyond the Dryosaurids, we come to the massive clade Ankylopolexia, which means the curved thumbs in Greek, 
which references the distinctive spike-like polexes of these animals. Ankylopolexians first appeared towards the end of the Jurassic, and tended to possess bulkier builds than their earlier relatives, with some forms reaching quite impressive sizes. The most basal genus appears to have been Camptosaurus, from the Morrison Formation of the Western United States. Measuring between 16 and 20 feet long on average, with fragmentary larger individuals potentially reaching about 22 feet, this fairly heavy set animal was roughly horse-sized, weighing over half a ton. Its skull was narrow and quite triangular in shape when seen from above, somewhat like that of Stegosaurus. Camptosaurus was still a fully bipedal animal, with comparatively small forelimbs, and was not able to drop down to a quadrupedal stance while browsing, like the later hadrosaurs could. It would have still utilised speed to escape from predators, being estimated to have had a top running speed of 25 kilometres an hour. As this genus was first described during the period of the Bone Wars, it has a confusing taxonomic history, with many species once assigned to it now viewed as their own genera, such as the contemporary Uteodon. This was a notably smaller animal, being just 2.5 metres or 8.2 feet long, but was overall quite similar to Camptosaurus. A younger genus, Hippodraco, was native to the early Cretaceous Cedar Mountain formation of Utah between 139 and 135 million years ago, with a name meaning horse dragon due to the vaguely equine appearance of the skull. Hippodraco is known only from a single immature specimen about 15 feet in length, although of course fully grown adults would have been larger, perhaps up to 20 feet. It lived alongside the formidable Dromaeosaur Utah Raptor, which was the largest carnivore in the environment, and probably fell prey to it from time to time. The Cedar Mountain Formation was also home to a diversity of other Iguanodontia nonithopods, which is a notable shift when compared to the earlier Morrison, wherein this group was notably rarer. It is possible that ornithopods are among the beneficiaries of the Tithonian extinction event, which saw marine regressions and an overall drop in global temperatures around 145 million years ago, leading to a possible reduction in sauropod diversity, although this is debated. By far the largest ornithopod present was the genus Iguana Colossus, which measured up to 9 metres or 30 feet long and weighed about 5 metric tonnes. Despite its name, it was not a particularly close relative of Iguanodon, with reconstructions often showing it as being capable of quadrupedal walking, as well as possessing large thumb spikes, although the holotype is lacking the forelimbs, so this remains quite speculative. It would have been a medium level browser in life, capable of reaching fairly high up into the trees when standing on its hind legs, while its closely packed teeth, powered by strong jaw muscles, effectively shredded plant material. Many near contemporary Ankylopolexians were also quite large animals, with their body plans effectively laying the groundwork for the rise of the hadrosauroids, and probably developing in response to the expansion of angiosperm plants by the early Cretaceous. A fairly close relative, Lanjiaosaurus, from the early Cretaceous of China, was even more massive, potentially reaching up to 10 metres or 33 feet long, and weighing about 6 metric tonnes, being comparable to an African bush elephant in size. Meanwhile, the genus Lurdusaurus, known from Albion age deposits in Niger, dated to roughly 112 million years ago, was a far more unusual animal. Measuring up to 30 feet long, this was a very heavily built iguanodont, with a small skull, comparatively long neck, barrel-shaped body, and powerfully built forelimbs equipped with large claws. The feta theorized to possess fleshy pads in order to support the animal's weight, which is in the region of 5.5 metric tons. This strange mixture of traits would have made Lurdusaurus resemble an ornithopod cosplaying as a sauropod, with it being suggested that the genus may have been semi-aquatic like modern hippos, which also have heavy builds and dense bones. It would also have been more effective at walking on all fours than other iguanodonts, and was probably quite a slow-moving animal, possibly retreating into rivers and lakes when threatened by a predator. Although Lurdusaurus was larger than any of the theropods that lived alongside it, such as the Abelisaurid Cryptops and the Carcharodontosaurid Eocarcaria. In addition, its powerful forelimbs and massive thumb claws could have been utilised as formidable weapons. Lurdusaurus lived alongside the striking and somewhat closely related genus Uranosaurus, an animal that I've always been fond of. In many ways, it represented a transitional form between more basal iguanodontians and hadrosauroids, with the skull being elongated and slender, 
well adapted for selective browsing, almost like that of a Lambiosaurine. It was also a relatively large genus, measuring up to 8.3 meters or 27 feet long, although the holotype was a smaller individual, probably a subadult at 6.5 meters. The forelimbs were quite elongated, being about 55% the length of the hind limbs, enabling the animal to effectively walk in a quadrupedal stance. Oranosaurus is best known, however, for the distinctive sail running along its back, formed of elongated neural spines, superficially similar to that of Spinosaurus. The purpose of this structure is still debated, with the most common explanations being for thermoregulatory purposes or for display and social signalling. An alternative hypothesis is that the back might have carried a hump consisting of muscle tissue or fat, resembling that of a bison or camel. It could also have been used for energy storage during the dry season. Like Lerdusaurus, it was a fairly slow-moving animal, although unlike the former, it was more lightly built and lacked large claws, with the thumb spike being relatively small. Beyond Oranosaurus, we come to the famous genus Iguanodon and its relatives, which may or may not form their own distinct family of Iguanodon today. The phylogenetic position of this genus is somewhat unstable, with some studies finding it to be among the most basal hadrosauroids, while others place it just outside this clade. In truth, there is a lot to say about Iguanodon, given its importance to the history of paleontology as a science, being one of the first dinosaurs to be scientifically described, with it being a good topic for a future video all by itself. To conclude this episode then, the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous saw the rise of the ornithopods from small and fairly marginal gazelle-like animals to large multi-ton browsers, with these developments coinciding with a minor extinction event at the end of the Jurassic, as well as with the expansion of flowering plants. Although exactly how such factors influenced ornithopod evolution is still quite poorly understood. What is clear is that their ability to efficiently chew tough vegetation was probably a major factor in the overall diversification of the group. In the form of the hadrosauroids, these animals would go on to major success in the later Cretaceous, spreading from their Laurasian homeland into Africa and South America by the end of the period. However, that is a story best left for another time. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering the evolution of the Axipitriforms, the lineage of modern birds that contains the carnivorous hawks, eagles, vultures and relatives. Please feel free to support me on Patreon if you'd like to propose your own ideas for future videos. And until then, I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.